First organized in 1824, Hendricks County was named for William Hendricks, then governor of the young state. From its humble beginnings, Hendricks County has risen to become the second fastest growing county in Indiana. Located in the heart of the county, just south of the Danville Town Square, lies the Hendricks County Historical Museum. The museum is dedicated to preserving important artifacts that help to tell the story of the residents of Hendricks County. Their collection includes artifacts from the Central Normal College, a space dedicated to military artifacts, and a parlor room decorated with late 18th century furnishings. The Cascade Middle School Pace class has come to the museum to investigate little known artifacts in their collection and help to share their story with the world. Come and join us as we examine this week's episode of The Secrets on the Shelf. The Avon Haunted Bridge and the Danville Twin Bridges are two iconic parts of Hendricks County. The 113-year-old bridges have long been part of the scenery of the county and have ingrained themselves into the local history. The Avon Bridge has found its way into the Avon Town Seal and the Twin Bridges has passed its name on to the local waste management disposal facility in numerous other locations in the area just as the previous steel train trussle and small car trussle gave their name to the Danville Bridge. The stories of haunting seem to frequent the bridges, as often as the CSX heavy freights and intermodals clatter, clank, and squeal across. In 1906, the Danville and the Avon Haunted Bridges were built. Both bridges are made of concrete with an open spandrel arch design and created by the engineer W.M. Dunn. The open spandrel arches were relatively new in bridges due to concrete having not been strong enough previously to handle the design. The bridges were double-tracked in 1908 to allow for higher train traffic over the line. The bridges are currently part of the Indianapolis-St. Louis CSX Main Line. The Danville Bridge serves to cross the West Fork of the White Lick Creek, and the Avon Bridge crosses the White Lick Creek. The Main Line then feeds into the CSX Avon Hump Yard. During late 1905, the old steel trussle that helped give the Danville Bridge its name and was supposedly haunted was being demolished to make way for the new bridge. Up until this point, the project was going according to plan, but on November 30th of 1905, an 80 pound lifting jack was perched high up on the trussle until the wind blew. A worker named Silas Walker was standing below the jack and a breeze blew the jack off of the trussle and it went plummeting down onto Silas's HUD. He somehow survived the initial impact, but he was unable to be saved and died shortly later. Later that year, on December 21st, an eerily similar disaster struck the construction site. As the foundation pilings were being hammered into the ground, the piling derrick's engine ran away, leading to the collapse of a large amount of the derrick. The derrick dropped onto a worker named John Overfield, crushing him to death almost instantly. Another worker standing nearby was thankfully only grazed by the piling derrick's driving weight as it fell. Are these accidents signs of a vengeful spirit who is killed during the construction of the trestle and is upset about the destruction of its home? There have been many stories surrounding these bridges. The most widely known is about the worker who fell into concrete. They say that there was a worker that tripped and fell into the rapidly curing concrete and was encased alive. They also say that if you go under the bridge at night, you can hear his hammer still hammering away at a bridge that will never be finished. There is another eerily spooky story that bears a striking similarity to of the, a worker who slipped and fell from a catwalk above a container of concrete. It is not clear whether this was one of the bridges or a previous trestle. His fellow workers grabbed a nearby cross-cut saw and lowered it to him only for the saw handle to pop from the worker's hand, and the man was buried alive and it has said that the saw stuck out of the bridge until the blade was cut off level with the concrete. There have been other supposedly hauntings that are attributed to the Avon Bridge, but in reality, due to the physical similarities between the bridges, the stories have swirled together in a, to a mixture from the two bridges.
This Civil War sword was donated by J. Nelson Coates, son of Virginia Keeney Coates. The sword belonged to Thomas Jefferson Nelson. His discharge papers tell that he was a sergeant under Lieutenant Edward McKeaton in Company M, 11th Regiment, Cavalry, Missouri Volunteers. He enlisted for three years on September 18, 1863, and was discharged July 27, 27, 1865, in New Orleans, Louisiana, by Special Order Number 187. He is 5'8 tall, white complexion, blue eyes, light hair, and his occupation when he enrolled was a farmer. One day, Thomas Jefferson Nelson and his friend got fed up with their sergeant and decided to go AWOL, absence without official leave. When they got out of the military, they went to a train to Louisiana to go buy some cattle for their new farm. All aboard! That's what Thomas Jefferson Nelson and his companion heard when they knew it was time to get on the train. We're going here to go to Louisiana and we're going to go get cattle. Uh, this right here, this is our land to raise the cattle and we will eventually start a very strong agricultural society in Louisiana. When they arrived at the train stop in New Orleans, they headed off to go see their new farm. When I got to their farm, they took a minute to look around at all the cattle and the beautiful big red barn. When Thomas Jefferson Nelson went back in the army, he started out as a sergeant. After being enlisted for almost three years, Thomas Jefferson Nelson was discharged on July 27, 1865 in New Orleans, Louisiana. In May of 1868, Thomas Jefferson Nelson married America Alice Leake, daughter of Lawrence and Amanda Leake. Later on in life, Thomas and America had raised four children. Nelson died in 1929 at the age of 89. This cabinet type phonograph was produced with extra storage below. It was produced by the Bush and Lane Piano Company and sold by the Montgomery Warren Co. We believe that the model was named the Sicilian Cabinet Grand. The model in the Hendrix County Museum and the Sicilian are both cabinet types with similar styles. Now, here is a clip of the original record player, which is located in the parlor room of the Hendrix County Museum. This clip also includes our tour guide, who is doing the Charleston, which is also a very popular dance back in the 1920s and 30s. You better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why, why? Santa Claus is coming to town. These record players were estimated to be in the years ranging from 1915 to 1930. After this, Dean Thurnell had purchased the record players at an antique auction. In 1990, Thurnell died. A year later, his wife and son donated the record player to the Hendricks County Museum under his name. The record player is now kept in the parlor room. The Great Blizzard of 1978 was one of the worst winter storms that ever hit the Ohio Great Lakes region. From 1978, there was a mug from the blizzard. It's called the Blizzard Cup. The Blizzard Cup is a vintage 1978 coffee mug from the blizzard. It's currently kept at the Hendricks County Museum in the glass shelf. It was donated by Alan Parsons to the museum in 2014. Recently, there was a snow blizzard that stormed through the Ohio Valley in the Great Lakes region. It left multiple feet of snow and even led people to die. Many people were trapped in their houses because the snow was piled so high in front of their doors. Temperatures have been in the 30s and 40s for the past couple of days, with rain and fog blocking away this building. Many people have provided us with their stories and things that they have experienced before and during the blizzard. I remember that I tried to go to work that day. And Mayor had announced that you were on the roads of Indianapolis. 
you'd be arrested. I had two roommates at the time, and we walked to get food. All the neighbors got together and brought what they had, and we got together to eat. That was actually the first time that I'd met most of them. Since the roads were shut down, we got to know each other for the day. And here we have another story with Candy Wilson about her experience during the snowstorms. Around the time of the first and second storm was the due date for my firstborn. The phone rang off the hook, people asking if all was all right. Then we lost phone service. We live near Coatesville. I had the flu. My baby wasn't born until February 5th and between the first and second blizzards. We had to get to the hospital, but the roads were so icy. This is the cane owned by John V. Hadley. It is 36 inches long and made of painted black wood. The head of the cane was supposedly made by jeweler Jesse W. Thompson. It was given to Hadley on December 24, 1898 by the Hendricks County Bar and Court officials after 10 years of service as judge. This cane was given to the Danville Public Library by his great-grandson, Bill and John Comer. He enlisted in the Civil War on August 20, 1861 and was discharged on March 22, 1865. In this upcoming clip, you'll see how John B. Hadley was captured by the Confederates. John was injured in the Battle of Wilderness and he was left unconscious. A soldier dragged him off and took him as a prisoner. John was taken to a Confederate hospital and after he was well, he was officially a prisoner. Where am I? What happened? Oh, you're awake. You were injured in battle and left unconscious. We'll be taking you as prisoner now that you're conscious again. John was first confined to a prison in Macon, Georgia. The soldiers then decided to send him to many different locations. He was always kept on the move. He was first sent to Savannah, Georgia, next to Charleston, South Carolina, and finally Columbia, South Carolina. John finally finds a way to escape the prison. After facing many obstacles, John reaches the Union lines at Knoxville, Tennessee on the 10th of December. John wrote an interesting story about his imprisonment and escape. The book was called Seven Months a Prisoner and was published by Scribner and Sons in 1898 in a little volume of the Ivory series. Hadley became a judge after returning home from the war. He later sold his house to a jeweler named Jesse W. Thompson. Hadley was awarded the cane after being in the war and becoming a judge. Thompson was supposedly the man who made the head of the cane. Hadley will always be remembered for his bravery and service. The building of which the little store was in is a green and light house near the old Danville Elementary School. Although, at the same address, the little store was in fact located in the small shed on the property owned by Corda and Oscar Andrews. Corda and Oscar Andrews own a grocery store on the corner of Indiana and Mulberry Street called Andrews OC Grocery. You can go play. Hey, Corda, how are you? Good, great. How are you? How's your son? Really good. He's about to start school soon. How's the grocery business? You know, it's decent. It's not exactly what I had planned. Things have changed a little bit since Austin's gone. Well, what do you have in mind? Are you going to change it up? <laughs> well, I'm kind of looking for changing it up a little bit to appeal more to the children in this town. I think that's a great idea. Hey, I gotta go find that rascal kid. Okay. Go get him. Eight years later. After Oscar Andrews died, Corda changed her grocery to a more manageable candy store called The Little Store. The new shop had been a very big hit to the students at Danville Elementary. Junior, have you been to the candy store on Mulberry Street? Um, no. Is it Coolio? What's they sell there? Oh, well, it's just a candy store. They have really cool candies like Nickel Nips and Reese's Cups. Hello. 
Oh, ma'am, can you drive, direct me to the butter brickle? Sure. Thank you. How much would that be? Yeah, you. Uh, I have to get back to recess now. Oh, you go to the dance elementary school right on the road, right? Yeah, I'm in the sixth grade. I've heard a lot of buzz about this place and uh, it's in my classes, so I decided to check it out. Well, I'm really glad that uh, your other students really love my class job. You better get back to recess, bud. Will do. Thanks again. Bye. 55 years later. Back in my day, that was the candy store for the school kids. Oh, okay, Grampy J. After you, sweetum. Grampy, I think something changed. You see, this image may look like it's representing an ordinary flag in an ordinary triangular box, but it is so much more than that. This is the Doc Foster Monumental Piece. Within this triangular box, it is inscribed the day that he was born, the day that he died, his name, and the war that he happened to serve in. This piece is used for honor and the people who have served in the military. Once a person passes away and they have served in the war, it is made at a place they served in and folded into the roots. Do you think what do you mean? I, I can't send them to you later, I guess. Doc Foster attended school for seven years before dropping out. He decided that his clothes were not as good as everyone else's. This caused him to decide that school wasn't for him and that he could save more money without school fees. Doc Foster. Yes, sir. You are here to receive your certificate for serving your time in the military. Thank you, kind sir. Thank you for your service. <coughs> Doc Foster served in the military for a period of time, and I got him a certificate in doing so. He got his military certificate in 1918. Serving in the military helped him get the flag in the box from the item, which is given to soldiers after they have fallen. This later becomes one of the items in Hendricks County Museum for the Doc Foster has been represented. A kid stopped by the barbershop asking for you today. Oh, which one? He said his name is David Chad. He needed help with his school project or something. Oh, uh, he's the grandson of Lucille Stan. Oh, that makes sense. You guys are friends. I told him that you would just stop by after we were done working. Doc Foster was a local barber and local trashman. He was known by everyone in the town and was a very helpful person. He and his friend Emma would always hang out and work together. One of his other friends with Steel Samber had a grandson named David Chad, and Doc Foster was very close with him. Doc Foster married Elizabeth Johnson in December of 1940 in Louisville, Kentucky. They were married for a while, but she sadly passed away at the age of 45 years old. Doc Foster never remarried after her death and was a widow for the rest of his life. Virgil Doc Foster was a very well-known man in Hendricks County, and to this day, people still remember him for his kindness. Living almost his entire life in Hendricks County, he died from natural causes at the age of 92 years old. He had many friends, and he was respected by everyone within the town. He lived life to its fullest and made every day a new adventure. This is our artifact, a picture of the Rockwood Tuberculosis Sanitarium. The sanitarium would care for people who had tuberculosis. This picture is 16.8 centimeters wide by 24.5 centimeters long. It is a picture of the very first main administrative building. This building was used for office and treatment rooms. Eventually, this building got remodeled to a three-story building to help better the headquarters of this sanitarium that attempted to cure tuberculosis. 
You might be wondering what tuberculosis is. Well, tuberculosis is a respiratory disease that mainly affects the lungs, but can also affect the central nervous system, bones, joints, and can even reach the skin. Some of the symptoms that people had looked for were raspy bronchial coughs, fevers, night sweats, rapid weight loss, and bloody saliva. The Rockwood Sanitarium tried to cure this disease with the use of cold and fresh air from Indiana. The idea of the cold and fresh air to cure tuberculosis came from the intelligent Dr. Thomas Beasley. He decided that the cool air in Indiana would work for curing tuberculosis because he had grown up in Indiana. Dr. Thomas J. Beasley was a white male and was born in Valley Mills in the year of 1881. At 15, he and his family moved to Indianapolis, Indiana, and at 17, he enlisted into the U.S. Army. Beasley was in the Philippines during the Spanish-American War that broke out in 1898. He had served in the hospital corps for 33 months, then he came back home to Indiana. Rockwood was ran in a pretty organized fashion. For instance, they would always have nurses and doctors at the administrative building. They were always staffed and ready to help cure people with tuberculosis. However, some people with stage 3 tuberculosis were denied care and weren't cured at the sanitarium. <coughs> what seems to be your problem? What's going on? I have a cough and a fever. I also have night sweats. I think I have tuberculosis. Okay, we can help you. I believe that you have tuberculosis. We will start your treatment today. Okay, what is the treatment? You will be fed raw eggs, fruit, and full meals. You will be moved to a cottage which has a window. The window should only be shut by the nurses that come around. We believe that with fresh air and proper nourishment, you will get better. Okay, sounds good. I will be back to check on you later. How are you feeling? I'm okay, but I still feel ill. Here soon, we will provide you with a meal. Okay, sounds good. All the food is cooked right here at the sanitarium. Along with this, the food comes from the rich farmlands of White Lick Valley. The ice that is served comes from White Lick Creek and is usually stored in sawdust. Rockwood owns both facilities that provide the food and ice. The methods used by Rockwood to cure tuberculosis weren't the safest or most reliable, but at the time the sanitarium opened, many people were dropping ill. Anyone who could find any sort of treatment would take it. Some of the methods used in the Rockwood Sanitarium consisted of untested practices such as mercury injections, which had no success. Around four to five years after the sanitarium had opened, other medicines and treatments had started to be developed. Along with this, another sanitarium opened near the area of the Rockwood Sanitarium. This slowly caused the decline and eventual end of the Rockwood Tuberculosis Sanitarium and shattered Beasley's dreams. police officers would go to the Danville police booth to listen in to cases and do quick reports. It was located on the northeast corner of the courthouse lawn in Danville in 1969. The police booth would be located where the war memorial is today. In this picture, you can see that Bill Berzini and his dispatcher are reviewing cases and the things that are being said on the police radio. In this next picture, you can see the Danville police booth in its original placement. This last picture shows Bill in his car receiving a call from his dispatcher scene that you are about to see is a fictitious event that might have happened during the 1960s at the Danville Police Base. Hey Bill, I got a 211 on the Danville Square or Mayberry Cafe. Robbery in progress. 10-4 on my way. Freeze! 
Put your hands in the air. Put your hands behind your back. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Oh, hey, Bill. How's your day been? Pretty good, honey. Do you mind whipping up some lunch for the prisoners? Sure, the same stuff. Yep. Thanks. I'm going to go wash up. Okay. Thank you so much, honey. Thanks for going to get some good food today. There. Here's your food. PB and J and granola. Hey, Billy, you done with work? No, I gotta go back to the police booth and do some paperwork. See okay. you later. Bye. Go home. Above is an image of Gwendolyn G. Goodwin's whack jacket. She was enlisted in June of 1943 for Whack Women's Auxiliary Army Corps at the age of 21. The jacket was, she was given is in the Eisenhower style. This was very popular during the 1940s to the early beginning of the 1950s. It was an issue jacket that was given to each of the Whack women. It was tailored to fit the women that were going into the force. It was the army green color and had different patches that had different meanings. She went through basic training in Texas and in Oklahoma. She also traveled overseas and served in the African, Middle Eastern, and European theaters. Throughout her time as a WAC member, she traveled to many different places. She learned her official title, which was financial clerk typist. She was the only woman working in finance at that time. She was very respected by all of her co-workers, which were men in her office. The patch on the shoulder of the jacket she was given was her division patch. On the sleeve of the jacket, there were gold bars. Each bar represented the amount of time that she served. One bar equaled six months. Gwendolyn had four bars, meaning she served for a total of two years. She received a diamond patch for her service in working with finance. On the shoulder, there was a rank patch that stated she was a T5 rank. On the right chest of the jacket, there is a patch known as a rupture duck. This signified that she was honorably discharged after her duties were done. She received ribbons and medals at the end of her service in the Army. One of her ribbons was in good conduct. She also received ribbons for her service in European, African, and Middle Eastern theaters. She got a medal signifying her service of participating in the WAC. Finally, she received a ribbon signifying that she had, they had won the war. The patches, medals, and ribbons all were presented to Gwendolyn as a way for her to be recognized for all of the work she did as a member of the WAC organization. They all signify something important and meaningful for all of the work that she did during her time overseas. After her service time, she came back to Indiana to settle down and start a family. This is a picture of Adrian Parsons. He was born on November 7, 1846. He was born in Guilford County, North Carolina. His father decided to move the family to Indiana, and they ended up settling in Washington Township, Hendricks County. Then a second son was born. His name was Oliver E. Parsons. Oliver was born on January 2, 1854. Adrian served two years during the Civil War in the Union Army. This was with Company I, 9th Indian Cap Company. 
After this, he bought a piece of land and bought some seeds from China. These seeds were soybeans, and after a bit, it reaped in a huge profit. He experimented with many new seeds, but none of them grew like soybeans. He grew these until he died on August 1st, 1929, in Hendricks County. Today, he has two monuments in Avon. These monuments show how he brought his soybeans to Indiana and how his work changed agriculture in Indiana forever. We need soldiers. We need soldiers. We need soldiers. Are you here to enlist in the army? Yes, sir. I know it's very desperate time for soldiers. That is true. We need a lot of soldiers to fight in the war. How old are you? I'm 17 years old. Ah, uh, I see you are very young. I know I'm very young, but I will not disappoint you. I like your attitude, but we're going to need to run a couple tests to see if you're good enough. Alright, that's fine. What's your name? My name is Adrian Parsons. Alright, it seems that you have passed your test. You will be in the Union Army with Company I, 9th Indiana Cavalry. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. We will get you into the field as soon as possible. Good luck, soldier. Adrian and his men were going on a scouting mission, and they are near Franklin, Tennessee. Then all of a sudden, he was shocked. I need to get to the log cabin that is near over there. Adrian was able to crawl to a spring, which was near a cabin, which enabled him I to survive. For four days and finally found the cabin. Then, on the fifth day, a member of Adrian's unit returned to his cabin, finding something he didn't expect. It's a good thing that you're alive. You must be you. Stay here. Every day they'll bring you food. The member took Adrian to a cotton shed. There he was fed food daily and stayed there until he recovered from his wound. After he was shot, the wound left Adrian with less physical vigor for the rest of his life. Because of this, he couldn't help in the Our artifact was a 1948 Admiral Television. It was designed by Ross Siragusa, who was the owner of the Admiral Television and Radio business. It was introduced in market in 1948 for in America, Canada, Italy, and Taiwan. In 1922, a man named Ross Siragusa was faced with a very large decision. He had to choose whether to devote his life to be a pianist or devote his life to building electronics. He ultimately decided to study electronics, a decision that defined his life. Two years later, in 1924, Ross graduated from high school and immediately started his business known as the Transformer Corporation of America, where he sold radio batteries. In 1929, the New York Bank attempted to purchase Ross's company for $5 million, but Ross refused the offer. However, in 1934, in the midst of the Great Depression, his company went bankrupt. But Ross didn't take his failure sitting down. He sold his car and most of his furniture to create a new business. Ross's cousin Vincent Baraka joined him in his new business in 1936. His new business focused more on the more stable radio market and named his new business Continental Radio and Television, even though they didn't sell televisions for many years. His first office was located in his garage, which was free of space after he sold his car. He began his new company by selling radios for under $10 to chain stores and jewelers. Once his company had only $200 left, Ross went to Pittsburgh and came back with an order for 250 radios. His company had made over $1 million in 1935, despite the fact they were still in the Great Depression. In 1936, Ross purchased the rights to the name Admiral for $200, which then became the new name of the company. In 1939, he capitalized on a lack of radio phonograph combination market at the time. Ross made an amazing decision when he bought $500,000 worth of electronic equipment right before World War II, which is when those products were hard to come by. This allowed them to make $42 million during the war by selling the supplies to the armed forces. Admiral received an excellence award for their protection efforts during the war. Ross prepared so well that when the war was over, Admiral had almost a monopoly over radio phonographs. In 1946, Admiral became an international business with planes and 
America, Mexico, Canada, Italy, and Taiwan. In 1947, Admiral dropped themselves into the television market, and in one year, their TVs became 40% of all their profits. Admiral became one of the first major advertisers of the television. By the 1950s and 60s, Admiral became the fifth largest supplier of appliances in the U.S. In 1966, Admiral introduced color TVs, which sold $414 million in their first year. However, the sales didn't keep rising, and eventually the Admiral company was sold in 1974. Eventually, later in 1996, Ross Saragusa died at the age of 81. Located in this picture, in the top left corner, is the mastery that was located in Danville, Indiana. This mastery was owned and made by Owen McAllister. Owen McAllister was married to Thelma McAllister and they actually both were in the business together. This mastery had many different uses. One of the uses was using the mice as lab rats. A lab rat was something that they would test vaccines and antibiotics on to make sure that those vaccines and antibiotics were safe for humans. So they would take the mice from the mastery and do those such things. A large percentage of the mice from this mastery were actually used in labs at that time. This picture is a picture of Bradford Woods. A lot of Boy Scouts would come up to this mastery and take the mice and feed them to the snakes located in Bradford Woods. Another simple use that they had was using the mice simply as pets as we do today. In this picture, you will see three employees that worked at the mousery holding two black mice. In the lobby at the Hendrick County Historical Museum, inside the display case, you can find two spoons engraved with the dates and important buildings such as the Hendricks County Courthouse. Both of the spoons are 5.5 inches long in length and 1 inch wide and are made of silver. One of the spoons, there is a mysterious 13 engraved on the handle. These spins are collector spins. Collecting spins was a popular hobby in the late 1800s. It was necessary to make a collector's spoon to commemorate the opening of the Hendricks County Courthouse in 1915. Souvenir spoon collecting or collector spoon came into America after wealthy Americans toured Europe. In Europe they saw spoon collections and they brought the practice back to America. The interest in souvenir spoon collecting suddenly became popular. Souvenir spoons were being made to commemorate American cities and towns, famous people, and historical events. When silver became more affordable for citizens, spoon collecting started to increase in popularity. Along with the spoons, there is an invitation to the opening of the new courthouse. The invitation contains pictures of the old courthouses as well as the new one. It includes a program for the night. You can also find a list of county officials and a description of the design of the new courthouse. The invitation states that there will be a master of ceremonies by the name of John Vestal Hadley. Who was John Vessel Hadley? What did he do? How does he relate to the Hendricks County Courthouse? John Vestal Hadley was born October 31st, 1840 from Jonathan and Ara Hadley. John Hadley was one out of seven children. In 1859, Hadley attended Northwestern Christian University or present-day Butler University. On August 31st, 1861, as a 21-year-old, he enlisted in the Hendricks County Infantry to fight in the Civil War. Hadley was later captured by the Confederates and wrote seven months a prisoner about being captured. 
When he escaped and returned, he was discharged. He moved back to Hendricks County and he married Mary Jane Hill, whom he had sent letters to during his enlistment. He started studying law after he and Hill moved to Indianapolis. After he finished studying law, he and Mary Hill moved to Danville, Indiana, and he opened a successful law firm. In 1868, Hadley was elected state senator for Hendricks and Putnam counties, serving for three terms, 1869 to 1873. In 1886, Hadley was elected judge of Indiana's 19th Judicial District and was re-elected for a second term in 1894. During his second term, he participated in the infamous Henshaw case. In January 1899, he was elected into Indiana's Supreme Court and served for 12 years until January 1911. Descendants and friends of Hadley considered him restless during his retirement. During his later years of retirement, Hadley wrote History of Hendrick County, Indiana, for People, Industries, and Institutions, Indianapolis, 1914. Two months before he died, Hadley was the master of ceremonies at a celebration opening the new Hendricks County Courthouse. Hadley died of a common cold on November 17, 1915. He was buried in a cemetery in Plainfield. His accomplishments during his life and his memory still honors the Spoons in Indiana to this day.